Hello again, Grade Sevens. In today's lesson, we are going to go through a variety of topics, starting by looking at the key components of the particle theory of matter. And then we will look at the three states of matter in terms of the particle theory. Then we'll look at an altered definition of temperature. This time we're going to define it from a quantitative standpoint. And then finally, we're going to discuss what effect temperature has on the speed of particles that make up a substance. Learning outcomes are to one, explain temperature using the concepts of kinetic energy and the particle model of matter, and two, describe the effect of heat on the motion of particles. So let's start off with the particle theory of matter. And we're going to examine three key points. The first key point tells me that all substances are made up of tiny particles that are called atoms. So for example, let's take a rectangular object. If you want to think of a real world object, that rectangular object could be a solid brick. What the particle theory tells me is that this solid brick is actually made up of a bunch of little tiny particles and they're called atoms. We can model the atoms visually by drawing little tiny circles. I know in the picture I only showed 15 particles that actually make up the brick, but in terms of like how many particles actually make up an object, even an object as simple as a brick, we're looking at like billions and billions and billions of particles. So there's a ton of particles that actually make up any kind of substance. So what does this tell us about an individual particle then? Well, an individual particle is too small to be seen. So if you isolated an individual atom, you could not actually see it. So you might ask me then, well, if I can't see an individual atom, then how can I see anything? Well, the example I'll use here, or the analogy I'll use is think about like, I'll use sand as my analogy. If you had a single grain of sand, okay, I'll represent it just with this one dot here. And if you had a single grain of sand and you put it on, for example, the kitchen table, it's probably really unlikely that you can actually see that single grain of sand. But if you start to add more and more grains of sand, and they kind of get clustered together, then you can actually see the pile of them. So even though we can't actually see an individual atom, we can see a large cluster of these atoms together, and that's how we're able to view objects. Two, no matter what kind of object you have, there is always space between the particles and the substance. Well, think of it like this. So if I look at this picture, and if I said to you, move these circles around so you can actually, you, you can decrease the amount of space between them. I don't think there's any orientation that you could move those circles around that would decrease the space between the particles. So even in the best case scenario, you're still going to have a little bit of space between them. And I can illustrate that space between them with this shaded purple region. So no matter what, there's always space between these particles. Number three, these particles are always in continuous motion. I'm going to talk about motion by looking at three different types of motion. And based on these types of motion, the particles are going to move just a little bit differently. First type of motion we'll look at is something called vibration. Particles that vibrate just slightly move back and forth. So for example, I have a particle and if a particle moves, if it vibrates, like it just would move a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, kind of just like oscillates or moves back and forth, but a little, a, a little bit, but its overall position doesn't change. So it just slightly moves back and forth, but it essentially just stays in place. And that's what we call vibration. Rotation 
is where we have a particle that spins. An example of this is if you have a globe uh, and you just take the globe and you spin it, well, the actual spherical globe isn't changing position. It's always occupying the same volume, but a point on the surface of the globe would change. So for example, if I look at this, this uh, little uh, atom here, if I looked at this little point X at the bottom, if the particle spins in a direction that's clockwise, which is what the arrow shows, and then later on, this point X would be somewhere up here. Another example of rotation would be where you, you take a basketball and you put it on top of your finger and you just spin it. So rotation is just spinning, but your overall position of your object is not really changing. Third type of motion is called translation. Translation is the motion of a particle in a straight line. What this means is, say we had a particle at point A, and then I grabbed this particle and I moved it, and it's now at point B. Well, to get from point A to point B, it's moved in a straight line. And that's what we call translation. So translation would be the motion of an object from one point to another. So in this case, your position is actually changing, unlike vibration and rotation, where your position of your particle is not really changing at all. We're going to look at three primary states of matter, although technically there are five, and I'll make a brief mention of the uh, other two ones when I go through the first three. So first primary state of matter is a solid. What we want to do is we want to look at these states of matter and describe them in terms of our particle theory. This small animation shows what the particles that make up a solid would look like. So we have all those spheres that make up all my individual atoms. So what do I notice about these atoms? Well, they're really, really closely packed together. In fact, there's not a whole lot of space between them. There still is space between them, but not much. They're very densely packed. Well, what about the motion? What kind of motion would these particles be undergoing? Rotation, vibration, translation. Well, it looks like in the animation, the particles are just very slightly moving to the side up and down. So that would definitely fall into the category of being vibration. The particles aren't really moving from point A to point B because they always seem to come back to where they started. So there would be no translation, uh, translational motion. The one thing that the animation does not show though is that as those particles do vibrate, they would also be spinning. Therefore, particles in a solid would undergo both vibration and rotation. Second state of matter, we have liquids. Again, let's look at an animation to see what this would be. Okay, now in this one, I can see that the particles are not quite as closely packed together. There seems to be a little bit more space between them. What I can also see is it seems like the particles are actually moving from point A to point B. I know the animation just keeps repeating itself over and over again, but if it wasn't repeating over and over again, the particles in a liquid can move from, one, uh, uh, from point A to point B. Therefore, they can undergo translational motion. So what happens to the particles in a liquid? Well, they slide past each other, so they can actually move around. And in terms of the motion, the particles in a liquid definitely undergo translation. They move from point A to point B. They also spin while they do this. And while they're spinning, they also slightly vibrate. They have those small little tiny oscillations. Slight, uh, when I say oscillation, I just mean like small little tiny movements. Third state of matter, we have our gases. And right away it becomes clear in a gas that there is a ton of space between the particles that make up a gas. Lots of space between the particles. What kind of motion would particles in a gas undergo? Well, they're definitely moving from point A to point B. Therefore, translation. As they're doing that, they're spinning. Therefore, they rotate. And as they're spinning, they would also 
they would also undergo those little tiny oscillations, those little tiny motions side to side. So all three types of motion, uh, you, you would observe particles in a gas undergoing all three types of motion, assuming you could actually see those particles, which you can't individually, as we've already discussed. Temperature. All right, so we gave a definition of this to start the unit of study off, and it was a very loose definition. We described temperature as a measure of how hot or cold something is. And I mean, that's not a very good definition. We, in, in science, we want to have definitions that are a little more scientific or perhaps even a little more mathematical because we can actually get some, maybe some like proper numerical measurements from a certain physical quantity like temperature. So here's a definition we're going to go with. Now, to define it, I'm going to make reference to a substance that contains five particles. We're not going to worry about the numbers just quite yet. I'll describe them in a moment. But let's say that we have a substance that is made up of five particles just to simplify the situation. So what's my definition of temperature? A quantitative definition of temperature tells me that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles that make up a substance. Well, we just worked through the working at data unit of study. And you see that word average is the same thing as the mean. So the mean is, it, it's you take the sum of all values in a data set and you divide by the number of points in that data set, or a mean is just an average. The one word though that we're not familiar with yet in this definition is, well, what's kinetic energy? Okay, so let's give a definition of that and then we can properly understand temperature. Kinetic energy depends on the speed of an object. And the way kinetic energy works is in general, the faster an object moves, the more kinetic energy it has. So for example, if you were to compare like the fastest speed that a car could move compared to the fastest speed that an airplane could move, an airplane would have a much larger amount of kinetic energy in compared to the car. Therefore, we can just simplify it as stating that objects that are moving faster have more kinetic energy. Energy, the unit of measurement for energy, is measured in a unit called a joule. So we talked previously about how mass is typically measured in grams or kilograms, how force is measured in newtons, and energy is going to be measured in a unit called a joule, which we're going to abbreviate with a capital J. Well, now let's look at these five particles. So I have five particles and the numbers inside the particles are telling you the kinetic energy of one of these particles. So one particle is a kinetic energy of 20 joules, one has 30 joules, one has 25 joules, one has 22 joules, and one has 28 joules. So based on what you see here, which particle would have the greatest amount of kinetic energy? And which one would have the lowest amount of kinetic energy? Well, the greatest amount of kinetic energy is the particle that has 30 joules of kinetic energy. That means that particle would be moving the fastest. The particle with the lowest amount of kinetic energy would be the one that has 20 joules of kinetic energy. So that'd be the particle that's moving the slowest. Now, these five particles, I've said, make up a substance. So what exactly is temperature then? Well, temperature would be an average value of the kinetic energy of all these particles. So how would we determine that? Well, again, the way to figure out an average is you find the sum of all values. So we take the sum of all those values and then divide by the number of values in our data set, which would be five. And I'll go through a more detailed uh, calculation of this in the example problem in a moment. So that, that's, a, that's what temperature is. Temperature is on average, what is the kinetic energy of the particles that make up the substance? Or what's the mean kinetic energy of the particles that make up the substance? We also want to consider is what happens to these particles when you either heat them up or you cool them. If I were to heat up these particles, what might you guess would happen to the kinetic energy of all these individual particles? 
Well, if you heat the mug, you'd be giving energy to the particles. Therefore, I might expect these particles to start moving faster. So for example, this one now might have 25 joules of kinetic energy if I heat it up. This one might now have 30 tools, uh, 32 joules of kinetic energy if I heat it up. This one might have 28. This one might now have 23 joules of kinetic energy. And this one might have 29 joules of kinetic energy. So what happens to this? If you, if you heat these particles up, what happens to the temperature? Well, obviously, if you heat something up, your temperature goes up. But why does it go up? Well, because your average is increased. Your average kinetic energy of these particles would now be a much larger value. The mean would be larger because all these individual values are now bigger. So let's summarize this. When the substances and the particles that make up a substance are heated, they would move faster. You're giving energy to particles, they move faster. If they move faster, then the sum of all the kinetic energies would be bigger. And then when you calculate the average, the average kinetic energy of the particles would also be larger. If the average kinetic energy of the particles is larger, then your temperature of your substance is going to increase. Therefore, heating a substance results in my particles moving faster and the temperature of the substance increasing. Well, what happens if we decreased the temperature of uh, the substance? So maybe we put it into like a refrigerator or a freezer or something. So if I put it into something, an area that's cooler, I would expect the kinetic energy of all these individual particles to go down. So maybe this guy would go to 18 joules. This one would go to 25 joules. This one would go to 20 joules. This one would go to maybe 21 joules. This one would go to maybe 25 joules. I'm just making these numbers up. But if you put it into an environment where it's cooler, there's actually going to be a transfer of energy from the particles to the surrounding. So the individual kinetic energy of these particles is going to decrease. Well, if the individual kinetic energy of all these particles decreases, then on average, the kinetic energy of all the particles is also going to go down. If your average kinetic energy of all your particles goes down, then your temperature is going to decrease. Therefore, when you cool a substance, the particles move slower. They move slower because they lose kinetic energy. And then your temperature decreases. And your temperature decreases because if you then calculate the average kinetic energy of your particles, it would drop. Let's go through one of these calculations. So example one, for the five particles shown below, calculate the average kinetic energy of these particles. So we could think of this as having a data set where we have like 20, 30, 25, 22, 28. The way we calculate an average or a mean is, so we'll use average here, so my average EK, we'll use EK as an abbreviation for energy kinetic or kinetic energy. That would be equal to the sum or the total kinetic energy of all my particles divided by the number of particles. And just to equate it to the equation we are using in the working with data unit. So my mean kinetic energy would be equal to the sum of all the kinetic energy values divided by n, where n is the number of data, uh, data points or particles that you have. Okay, so let's calculate this. To figure out the sum, you just add all those numbers together. So we go 20 joules plus 30 plus 25 plus 22 plus 28. We divide by 5 because that's the number of particles that we have. And then we can calculate the sum, which would be 125 joules. And again, a fraction means division divided by 5. 125 joules divided by 5 is going to be 25 joules. Therefore, your average kinetic energy of the particles that make up the substance is 25 joules. Just make sure when you're doing calculations on the work you're going to get assigned in a moment, try to show this from the three-step procedure. So what I would do is for step one, you write down the equation you're going to use. Step two, you plug the numbers into the equation. And you can kind of do like a second if, if you want to, you can do like a, a, a second step for uh, here where you actually just uh, calculate the sum. 
And then step three is you calculate the answer. So again, step one is write the equation down. Step two is plug your numbers in, do a substitution. And then step three is write down the answer. And it's just nice to communicate it by putting a box around it. Okay, so you can complete the assignment called the particle theory of matter. However, if you want to stick around for a moment, then I can just briefly talk about uh, a little bit more about if you want to take an atom, what you can break it down to, and then also talk a bit more about the other two states of matter. Okay, so I'll do that if you want to stick around here. So what we know is that the particle theory tells me that the atom is the smallest possible particle, okay? Atom makes up all my individual particles. It turns out though, that an atom is actually made up of smaller parts. So I'll show you what these smaller parts are. Yeah, this is not something you need to worry about uh, in, until like much later science grades. Okay, so what does an atom look like? Well, inside of an atom, you can think of it like this. You have this like dense core that we call a nucleus. And around that dense core called, called a nucleus, think of it like a planet. We have in orbit. So use little dashed lines to show like an orbit. When I say an orbit, I mean like the orbit of perhaps like the moon around the uh, the Earth. We have these little tiny particles, which I'm going to write down as E negative, that are called electrons. So if you break an atom down, an atom would actually be made up of a central core called a nucleus and these other particles in orbit that are called electrons. Now we can actually take the nucleus and we can break it down into smaller particles. An electron, you can't. An electron is, is a fundamental particle. You can't break it into smaller pieces. So what's the nucleus made up of? Well, let's show the nucleus. So this is my central core. What's inside of here? Okay, I'm gonna grab a different uh, ink color. So maybe this time we'll use blue. Okay, inside of here, you have some other subatomic particles. You have one particle, I'm gonna write down P plus, that's called a proton. And you have another particle, I mean, there could be more than one of these, by the way. Depends on the element you're looking at. We have another particle, it's called a neutron. It turns out that protons and neutrons also can be broken down into even smaller particles. They're broken down into smaller particles that are called quarks. So let's say we take a proton What's a proton made up of? Or let's say we took a neutron. What's a neutron made up of? Okay, so let's go to a different ink color. Uh, let's do like a brown color here. Okay, they are made up of a combination of quarks. And there are a couple of quarks we can look at. There's one that's called an up quark. We'll use U for an up quark and we'll use D for a down quark. It turns out a proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark. And a neutron consists of one up quark and two down quarks. And that's just pretty much as far down as you can go. You can't break these quarks apart. So if you want to take an atom and really break it down, that's as far as you could go. You could break it down into the smallest particles you would have. And I'll just kind of like highlight this. Would be an electron. So an electron is a fundamental particle. It's like a building block. Can't break it down. And these up and down quarks. Can't break those down. There are two other states of matter as well. I'll just talk about one of them. There's one, uh, 
there's actually two. There's one called, a, I think it's like a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is, I think it's like a substance. It's at like a ridiculously cold temperature somewhere close to absolute zero. I think these particles can only ever be, or these, these substances can only ever be produced in, uh, uh, in a lab setting. So we have, I'll say other states of matter. So we'll say four. I'm not sure if it's spelling it right, but Bose Einstein condensate. And that's essentially a substance at really cold temperature. Usually you can only get these in a lab setting. The other state of matter that's a lot more common is something called a plasma. What are plasmas? They're gases at extremely high temperatures. So we have the two extremes. We have really cold temperature and we have really high temperatures. Well, we can actually use our broken down model of the atom to explain what happens to a gas at a higher temperature. At a higher temperature for a gas, your, your gas becomes ionized. What ionized means is you give so much energy to the atom that you get these electrons become so excited because they get so much energy that they actually completely leave the atom. Now, here's the thing under normal circumstances, like for example, this atom, if we looked at its electrical charge, an electron is a negatively charged particle, it has a, a charge of negative one. A proton has a charge of positive one, a neutron has no charge. So a normal gas would have, think of this in terms of like integers. If you went positive one plus negative one, that tells me my overall charge on the, the gas. Well, those are opposite integers, so that would just be equal to zero. However, if you removed one of the electrons, then you would have a net charge of positive one. When you have substances that have a net charge, it means that they can conduct electricity. You want an example of this? This is what happens during a lightning storm. The particles in the air, like where there's, a, where there's about to be a lightning strike, they get so hot that some of the electrons, well, they just, they leave the gas. And now they're, and now it, the gas is a plasma. It's a gas at a really high temperature and it's now ionized and therefore it can conduct electricity. And then we have our bolt of lightning go from one spot to another. So that's a little bit more information. Everything I did in this slide is like well beyond like what you need to know at the grade seven level. But if you're just curious to know a bit more about what my fundamental particles are in terms of how I can break an atom down or what your other states of matter are, I hope I did a okay job of explaining at least a couple of things about how the, uh, how these things work. Okay, I will talk to you in the next lesson.